Well, Sean, thank you for coming to do the show tonight. You know, the last time you were here was a totally different situation, so can't even begin to compare it to that. But I want to talk more about, about the new music, Off of the Greatest, and the new band. Because, as all of your fans and the rest of the world knows, for the last 10 years you've been doing these incredibly personal and, and deeply emotional songs, but never with that kind of a you know, that kind of a soundtrack. So what was the whole idea behind this record and wanting to have that whole Memphis sound as part of it? Um, all the first, all the, uh, all my other records, I was just kind of like learning as a, as a person to um, write songs and learning to sing. I mean, I used to sing, I sing, sing more now, the, now, the way that I did when I was a little kid. And I think through trying to find my own self, you know, when you're younger, you know, you're kind of searching for who you are and, you know, as sort of experimenting with music as sort of a, an art form to sort of find myself or something, you know. Um, and uh, when, when I decided to um, record with, with, um, in Memphis, with Memphis, um, it was a sort of, uh, I was kind of being sarcastic with my record label when they asked me. It was before Soundcheck for a show in London. I was kind of just hanging out with my friends. I had to go to Soundcheck. I just wanted to talk and hang out and eat dim sum. And he's like, Mike from Matador said, now, Sean, what's up with your, you know, are you going to record with the band? What are you doing for the next record? And I had been recording solo stuff, you know, in Barcelona and Atlanta. And, um, I thought to myself that I was going to be compiling all these solo songs, you know. But I kept hearing about the band, you know, people wanting a band, people wanting a band, a band this, a band that, fans, record label, whoever, whatever, band, band, band. And it kind of, I was just like, my mind off the top of my head, I thought Otis Redding's band. But knowing, you know, Otis Red, you know, the, the Memphis, old Memphis people, there's still some people, my friend Judah Bauer from the Blues Explosion, had told me that Al Green's band was still playing, and I was like, well, so I just said to him, Al Green's band. And he's like, oh, well, how will we get in touch with them? And I said, well, Robert Gordon lives in Memphis, because I met him when I did, 10 years ago, when I did my first record for Matador in Memphis, I did it in Memphis at Doug Easley's place, which since then, unfortunately, has burned down. So I said, uh, uh, Robert Gordon could, 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 could get them. Oh, well, who, you know, and I was like, well, you know, Stuart Sykes, who worked on my first record for Matador years ago with Doug Easley, I mean at Easley Studios, um, who had just gotten a Grammy for engineering um, Loretta Lynn with Jack White's thing. I was like, well, Stuart Sykes will be my engineer. And so, okay, now I want to eat my dim sum and hang out with my friends. I got to go sound check in 20 minutes. He gets his laptop out, blah, 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 blah. I go to the bathroom, he gets a check, and then he's got a reply, you're recording in a month. The difficulty, like I have heard it in different like, I have heard the album since since we've been playing live, you know, since April. Um, and uh, the problem I find with the album is that, you know, hey, how are you doing? We all met first day. Hey, how are you doing? Nice to meet you. You know, we sat down. Okay, how does this song go? And they did the Nashville number system, so I just played in the, you know, played the song for them to listen to, to chart the number, Nas Nashville number style, um, you know, and then, okay, that's it, we went, the stu we went into the recording room, did the song, came back out, okay, now how does the next one go? So there was, now that we've been playing them live, like, there's so, it's so much more open, and it's, there's so much more room for them as individuals to sort of, you know, move and, sh you know, shimmy in the songs, whereas when we were recording them, whether I was playing piano and singing with them or playing guitar and singing with them, I was more focused. I noticed on the album, I was more focused with my playing than I was my singing. And so that's what I noticed live, is that I'm able to actually forget playing an instrument and I can actually sing, and that's what I you know, love um, to do. When did you start to realize that this is something more than just what I do for fun? Well, I never really thought I was a singer. Um, I always used to love to sing. My dad is a singer. Um, my mom and stepdad. My mom was a singer-ish thing. 
she was a singerish thing. My stepdad was in a band, a couple, of few bands in Atlanta. Um, my grandmother was always singing in church, and she'd always tape record me and my sister singing to get my sister singing together. Um, I have a recording of when I was six of singing the Gambler. You got no wind, hold on, no wind, hold on, no wind, walk away, no wind, run. You better count your money. When you're sitting at the table, there'll be time enough to count. Who in the deal and done, ba 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 ba. And like, like that's just how I was as a kid, you know, because I was Southern. My grandmother was really Southern. You know, my mom and dad and stepdad were kind of like, you know, they were like the difference between, you know, they were like, you know, going to protest, not going to Vietnam. They were a little different, but like my grandmother raised me a lot. So I have like that sort of countryness from her being raised a lot by her growing up, whatever, so I never really thought of myself as a singer, but I love to sing. Then when I moved in with my dad, he, you know, moved in with my dad when I was 16, and uh, there were instruments around, but I wanted to be a painter. I love to paint, and I love to paint, whatever, but uh, I never realized I was a singer until about a couple years ago. Really? As music, as playing a guitar, it was just something that I picked up as a, uh, a uh, hobby, like if I had gotten myself a camera, you know, if I'd gotten a camera, I would have probably, maybe I'd have like, you know, a few books of p photographs or something. Maybe I'd be talking to, you know, the Institute for Photography in Austin instead of Austin City Limits. <laughs> Being raised a lot by my grandmother, I'd always ask her, and I still do to this day, tell me about the story about when you went to school and the um, cougar was following you and you had to drop your lunch pail. You know, oh, we were, oh, we were so scared. Blah, 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 blah. Tell me about the time when you used to churn the butter and uh, you'd leave it, you'd leave it so in the morning the, the thick uh, cream would have sat on the top and, oh, and we'd get the biscuits from the oven and we'd just scoop off the top of the cream. You know, like scones and cream, whatever. So I was all, she always had amazing stories, you know, oh, we just jump up behind the horses and just ride them, just, you know, bareback and stuff. She also had the amaz amazing stories. Oh, I was five, I remember picking cotton and my fingers were bleeding and da-da-da. The storytelling thing that was just like a part of, you know, just a part of daily life or something, you know what I mean? Like hanging out with her or whatever. And then, um, and then... That's what songwriting is all about, is telling stories. That's, that's one of the best things about country music. Maybe not so much today as in the old days, but uh, they, they have a way of telling great stories through the music. It all comes from somewhere. Like, yeah. So I guess it came from there. And then, like, in school, you know, like middle school, right, I want you to write a story about, you know, whatever, write a story. So I, I thought that, you know, I wanted to be a writer, I want to be a journalist, I want to go to wars, I want to be a... You know, I'm gonna write. I thought I wanted to be a writer, and nah, I didn't get older. Da, da, da. I never really wanted to be anything at that. You know, once I reached high school, I wanted to be a stoner. I wanted to be a loser. <laughs> but um, I'm glad that I am what I am. I think I'm really just an example of um, of 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 um, the possibilities that are that are there every day, everywhere. Um, um, like I saw a sermon once recently on TV in Los Angeles that he was saying, well, you had to be back here, you know, flipping burgers because there was this experience you had, not about the burgers, but about this manager that taught you this one lesson. Then you were over here a few years later, and if you did you know, this different job, and if you didn't know that one lesson, you wouldn't have, you know, met this person who showed you this about life. and." Yada yada yada. But I think I'm just literally an example of of the possibilities of, you know. I mean, I'm I'm sure I could have. There are so many different things I could tell you, but I'm very lucky to have been open to, um, uh, what's the word? Opportunities. Been open about opportunities. Come on, Sean. You should just move to New York. I have a spare room up here. My friend from Tennessee. You know, you should move up here. I have a spare room. Mm, okay. You know. Come on, Sean, you just play in a band with me. Come on, if, if you play with me, then Glenn will play with us, and Blink Glenn plays with us, and Damon will play with us. And I had a crush on Damon, and I was like, okay, 